we're all going through at the minute. So thank you for being here with us. I think we're going to get started now. I can see it starting to trickle down. So we'll get started properly. So for those of you who have just joined, I'm Alex. I'm the Public Relations Officer for BPSA. So I get to work with some amazing companies like Lizzie at RB um, and really get to bring you a lot of insight into what goes on in the pharmacy world and make sure that your learning is as best it can be outside of university. So tonight we're going to be talking about lower GI and I'll let Lizzie go through that in a minute. But um, there is lots of interactive stuff in this webinar. So make sure you take in part some of them. Um, it won't be a functional test. You're not going to get a grade at the end. So just have a bit of fun with it. Um, enjoy the webinar and I hope you get a lot out of it. Um, as we're going through, you can use all of our social medias to get in touch, say how much you're loving the webinar and great to see so many of you joining us from every school of pharmacy we have across the UK. So really, really good to see all of you and different years as well. I've seen some first years, some third years. I've even got a couple of pre-regs popping up. So thank you for joining us on this Wednesday, the second webinar of the year. So without further ado, Lizzie, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you very much, um, Alex, for uh, kicking off the webinar tonight. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for giving up your Wednesday night to learn a little bit more about uh, lower GI. Before I introduce myself, I would just like to give you uh, a little bit of housekeeping about um, how we are going to run this. So if I just start my presentation. As Alex mentioned, there will be some interactive stuff that I would like to do, but it's not a pass or fail test. It's all anonymous, so I won't know who answered what, but it's something that really helps to uh, just monitor the engagement to let me know if you are still awake and with us, but then also just gives a bit of an insight where you are in terms of uh, the particular topic that we're gonna be covering today and how you find it, whether you feel like you're gaining a little bit of confidence. So in order to do this, um, I set up a polling with a couple of polling questions for you, which you can access either by joining through vvox.app, or if you go into the app store, you can download the app, however, you don't have to. But if you prefer to do it through a downloaded app, that's um, all means you can go ahead and do that, or you can use the QR code as well that you can see on the screen just scan it with your phone camera. And the uh, meeting ID is visible on the slide there, but when we come to the polling question, it will be repeated again in case if you um, don't manage to log in straight away. So this is just something that um, I'd like to use to make it a little bit more fun and um, it's not gonna be left our PowerPoint um, by the end. And the other thing that I would like to mention is that I would really like to receive your questions about the topic. So in the chat box, if you would like to put in your questions, Alex uh, facilitated this marvelously well last time. So he's going to be helping me to answer these questions, which I will do at the end. So as these questions pop in your head, please put them in and I'll, I'll go through these or as many as possibly I can at the end of the presentation. And I suppose it's probably not coming as a surprise that I will also have a little survey for you. This is really helpful for us. As you know, there have been a lot of changes over the last 10 months, one of which was having to do training online instead of being able to do these face to face. So getting a bit of a feedback, what you thought about the webinar, the presentation, the content would be really helpful for us going forward. And we do these survey questions after every single presentation we do. Um, across uh, various different teams that we work with. So it will be something that you can access again through the VVOX app. So if you would be so kind at the end of today or maybe tomorrow, if you don't feel like doing it right after the presentation, if you could just answer these questions, I would be ever so grateful. So um, as Alex mentioned, um, I work for our, I'm a pharmacist. I qualified in Hungary quite a long time ago. Um, it's more than 16 years now, would you believe it? So um, in Hungary, the training is slightly different. So it's five years. Uh, at the end, you get a master's degree. And then I also did a three-year postgraduate diploma there, uh, which was something that was kind of compulsory if you wanted to run your own pharmacy. 
But then I decided to uh, move countries and I was recruited to come to work in the UK in 2009. So I've got experiences from both countries. Um, I've done hospital and community pharmacy in Hungary as well as here in the UK. I've done all sorts of different projects. Um, some of them are quite unique where I was able to learn different skills like nursing duties, which are kind of beyond of the scope of an everyday pharmacist role. So I was fortunate in that sense that I was able to do all sorts of different things. But whilst I was doing these different projects and trying myself out in different roles, um, training somehow was always a priority. I, I love to learn new things, but then also I, um, I absolutely love teaching other people and explaining things. So I can probably talk for England uh, if I need to. So it's probably not a surprise that um, after doing another master's degree in London, and doing some more work in community pharmacy, I ended up working um, as a training and development manager at RB. So I jumped ship in 2019 uh, from my latest role in community pharmacy to come and work for uh, Rakit and Benkiza, if you know that name better. And I haven't looked back since and, I, since, and I absolutely love doing what I do. So hopefully that comes across the way I talk. I will try to slow down a little bit because I know when I'm excited about a topic, um, I tend to go overboard with the speed. And I am very excited to be here today. So thank you so much for having me for the second time. And hopefully we can make this a regular occurrence because there's a lot more we can talk about, not just uh, constipation, diarrhea, and IBS, which is the topic for today. So what I would like to do is go through the definition, the potential causes, and risk or trigger factors that we need to consider when we are talking to our patients, when they come for advice at the counter. Then I would also like to cover the OTC management options of these conditions. And we will look at these in line uh, with NICE guidance and also consider lifestyle advice you might want to help your patients with. Um, and then we will also touch on something that was very significant in terms of managing constipation that happened uh, last year and that is the upscheduling of stimulant laxatives. So we will touch on that as well. And as I'm from RB, of course, I can't do a presentation without touching on our products. So I will introduce you to some of the products within our lower gastrointestinal portfolio as well. So this is something when you're doing your uh, practical placement, you can use to support your recommendations when you're talking to your patients. So why do we focus on lower GI and particularly on constipation. So as I already mentioned last year, something quite significant happened um, affecting community pharmacy, and that is the upscheduling of stimulant laxatives. So on the 18th of August, 2020, the MHRA published their statement on the upscheduling. And if we consider that Currently, stimulant laxatives make up 60% of the OTC constipation market, despite being third line recommendation. You can probably expect some changes and patients are likely more likely to come to your counters for advice because a lot of the products that they've been used to seeing out on the shelf in self-selection would be behind the counter now. And this is in addition to all the changes we have been witnessing within the UK healthcare landscape over the last couple of years. So if you think about the self-care messaging, starting with the de-prescribing guidance that was issued in 2018, then um, more recently, the um, Community Pharmacy Consultation Service that has been going on for more than a year now, and more and more branches have been added how patients can be referred to community pharmacy for advice for certain self-limiting conditions and for self-care advice. These are all um, adding to the pressure of community pharmacy, but equally it is something that gives us the opportunity to be more present and just show our skills, how we can help our patients with these self-limiting conditions and minor ailments, one of which is constipation, for instance. So let's start with that. Um, and before we start going into the details of constipation, just a brief overview of which part of the body we're talking about. So as your university students, I'm sure you know way more about the anatomy and the physiology and you remember probably way more than what I do after having left university 16 years ago. But 
if you just consider um, the lower GI tract for a moment. So what we are talking about here is starting from the small intestine all the way through the large intestine rectum and the anal passage. And this is something where the um, process of digesting food continues. This process, of course, starts immediately as, as you start smelling and tasting food. The absorption of nutrients um, and fluids into the bloodstream uh, is what provides energy, building blocks, and it contributes to a stable homeostasis for our body. Also, by processing waste products, it helps to eliminate these. And gut motility and peristalsis normally happens at a speed that allows these nutrients and fluids to be absorbed. But then if there is a problem with this process, if it is disturbed, then it can lead to symptoms such as constipation or diarrhea maybe. So we are focusing on the lower gastrointestinal tract and the three probably most common OTC manageable conditions that you might come across when you're talking to your patients. So this will be my first polling question for you. So if you are able to find the vivox.app app site or if you have downloaded the um, application, then have a look at this first question and I just opened the poll for you. When you're talking to your patients um, about constipation, how confident are you diagnosing them with these conditions? or when it comes to diarrhea or IBS, for instance. So when you're talking about lower gastrointestinal problems, do you feel very confident on most cases, confident on some, average, not so confident, or still in training? Now, I do realize I'm talking to university students, so please don't all of you answer still in training because I, of course, uh, that would defeat the object. But if you have been, uh, doing your placements in pharmacy? Have you had many patients that you were able to talk to? And how did you feel about making the diagnosis? So let's see if I've got some answers here. Oh, yes, excellent. So I'm very pleased to see that I've got some confident and very confident people in um, with us tonight. Uh, and I'm hoping that those people who don't necessarily feel so confident your confidence level will um, increase by the end of the presentation. Now, a very similar question coming up that I would like to ask you. So first, you made the diagnosis. How do you feel about advising these patients on lower gastrointestinal conditions? Uh, what's the best thing for them to take, for instance, if you um, make um, a decision that the patient needs to take some medication or would you be able to advise them on um, lifestyle advice as well? So same question, uh, same potential answer. So very confident on most, confident on some average, not confident or you feel like you are still just very much into your training. And let's have a look. Okay, um, I guess it's probably uh, obvious that it, the numbers will be very similar here, but I can see that in terms of advising, a lot more of you are a bit more confident. So that is excellent to see. So if we focus on constipation first after this um, bit of an introduction, constipation is basically a symptom-based disorder which occurs when pieces remain in the colon for a prolonged period of time, which then leads to excess water absorption. And as a result, the pieces become dry and hard. So the patients would describe these as they have infrequent stools, which means less than three times a week. They would describe it as it's difficult to pass the stools or they may experience sensation of incomplete emptying. But as an overall consideration, I think the best way to define it is if you consider what's normal for the patient. And if we say that constipation is a passage of stool that is less frequent, that would be normal for that particular person, then you can easily make a diagnosis. One thing to bear in mind that if um, acute constipation is not treated and is turned into chronic constipation, that can lead to further complications such as hemorrhoids, fecal infection, or even incontinence. 
So something that ideally should be dealt with um, in the first instance when the patient starts to experience the symptoms. Some of these we already touched on, like a difficulty passing stool when it comes to your patients describing their symptoms, also dry, hard or lumpy stool. But there are some other symptoms um, patients would share with you. Uh, just make sure that you always use your RAM questioning technique, which I'm sure all of you are aware of, or some sort of a, a set of questions depending on um, which pharmacies you work in, whether a particular branch prefers to use a different set of questions. But I believe the RAM questioning technique is quite widely used. So what other things do patients say? They may say that they've got a stomach ache. They can experience cramps as well. Already mentioned the inability to empty the bowels completely. They can also feel quite bloated as well when feeling constipated. And loss of appetite is a very common symptom. I would just like to pause here for a moment. So it's quite easy for us to talk about these symptoms, the symptoms patients may experience with constipation. But it's not an easy topic to um, discuss. And why is that? Nobody really likes to talk about constipation and bowel movements in general. But imagine if it's something that just came out of the blue, you don't really know what's caused it. Um, you don't really know how to discuss it. It's not something often people within families like to talk about. And imagine the difficulty the patient might find themselves in when they have to come into a pharmacy and talk to a complete stranger about it. So from my experience as a pharmacist, the best thing you can do is if you are able to take them away from the counter, they probably feel a lot more relaxed if you can take them into a consultation room or even just to the side where there is no chance of other, other people in the queue overhearing the conversation. So make them feel comfortable so that they are willing to give you all the information you require to make the diagnosis. Because in most cases, indeed, it would be just a simple, uncomplicated case of acute constipation. But we have the responsibility to exclude, exclude potential uh, serious problems uh, the patient might be suffering with. So just make sure that you approach it with confidence, uh, be confident asking the question, but also be open-minded and ask open questions so that the patient is willing to share the information with you. Uh, and that way you can make the best diagnosis possible to support them. So when we look at the different types of constipations, um, it's worth mentioning that you can class them as acute and chronic, but for the purposes of OTC management of constipation, we will be focusing on acute constipation, which is usually temporary and it can be managed uh, by the patient, so self-management here, with lifestyle changes and OTC laxatives. However, we mustn't forget about chronic constipation, so this is something that would be present for a longer period of time. The, the definition says that um, the symptoms are present for at least 12 weeks, in the previous six months, and that's when the GP would make a diagnosis as it's potentially a chronic constipation case. But these patients always require regular review by their GP, and in some cases, they need to be referred to a specialist as well. But it doesn't mean you can't support these patients, so you can always help them with lifestyle and dietary advice. And in some cases, they may require your help for laxatives although it's important to remember that in most cases, they will receive these on prescription. When it comes to constipation, in a lot of cases, that there is just simply a no known cause, but it could be that in some secondary types of constipation, there could be an organic cause, something that is caused by either some medication or medical conditions. So just briefly, if you look at these, and I would like to point this out, this is not an exhaustive list, it's worth referring to guidelines or even to the SMPC of particular drugs if you suspect that the patient might develop constipation because of a particular medication they are on. But uh, some examples for you, so aluminium containing antacids, some analgesics, antidepressants are well known um, for causing constipation, calcium channel blockers, diuretics, um, but even some supplements containing iron and calcium can cause uh, constipation. 
If you look at the group of drugs that you can see on the screen here, think about your elderly patient, how many of these they would have on one monthly prescription. More often than not, maybe a combination. So your older patients or those patients who are on a combination of different drugs are even more predisposed to developing constipation than anybody else, something to bear in mind. And then if you look at uh, organic secondary causes as in medical conditions, it could be uh, a bowel uh, obstruction, in which case, of course, that needs um, um, intervention by a doctor, potentially surgical, if uh, the situation is quite um, dire. But there are some medical conditions that can lead to it. Irritable bowel syndrome we will cover later. Um, hypothyroidism is not very well known to lead to constipation, but it's quite common. In some case, cases, a diabetic patients can develop constipation as well. And then again, neurological conditions. Think about your patients with Parkinson's disease or um, other neurological conditions that can affect muscle tone. Um, these patients are also predisposed to developing constipation. So just some things to consider when you look at those patients who are presenting regular monthly prescriptions, more often than not, with quite a few items on them. So if you look at some epidemiology data behind constipation, it's very common. Um, affects more women than men, and it's more common in adults, um, older adults, and of course, during pregnancy as well. Why during pregnancy? Well, there are quite a lot of things that contribute to this. So first of all, the growing size of the fetus that will put pressure on the bowels and that can slow down things. And also because of the changes in the hormone levels, it can affect uh, smooth muscles around the gastrointestinal tract. So it can lead to all sorts of unpleasant uh, symptoms to develop. So for example, heartburn, reflux can develop during pregnancy, but equally constipation as well, because of those bowels might become slightly um, lazier, if you like, um, because of the hormonal changes. So that's another reason why it's so common in pregnancy. Uh, it affects approximately one in seven adults. Now, constipation is a little bit more common in children, can affect one in three, but the reason why children develop constipation is very different from the reason of those in adults. And we will be focusing on constipation in adults today. In children, you would have to consider other things like um, changes in diet when they are being weaned off or stress of starting uh, nursery, preschool, um, tra potty training, all sorts of things. So the, the physiology, the pathophysiology behind developing constipation in children is very different. So let's focus on adults. What are the trigger of risk factors we need to uh, consider? So I already mentioned older age and pregnancy. And a lot of these are well known, commonly known factors such as lack of fiber, lack of exercise, not having enough fluids in your diet. Low calorie intake may not be a um, particularly well known risk factor, but if you think about those patients who are recovering after illness or surgery or elderly patients who are losing their appetite, unfortunately not having enough calories in their diet can lead to constipation as well. Stress and anxiety is also a very uh, well-known um, risk factor for developing constipation. One thing I would like to point out here is ignoring the urge. Um, it probably sounds obvious, but it's often overlooked that um, not having a good hygiene practice in terms of making sure that you need to go to the toilet, you actually go. Um, a lot of people don't realize that ignoring the urge regularly can indeed uh, lead to constipation, which is a lot more difficult to manage if it's a regular habitual occurrence. So always advise your patients, they should not ignore the urge. They need to make sure that when they need to pass tools, they have the ability to do so and they act on it. Now, I already mentioned van questioning technique, making sure that the patient is comfortable discussing the various different symptoms. So I just like to briefly touch on red flags. Um, consider referring the patient to the GP. If you see 
uh, constipation accompanied with some other symptoms, such as an older person who is complaining of abdominal pain, and they have also noticed there is blood in the stool, particularly if they report sudden weight loss or if they have been diagnosed with anemia or they are known to have uh, problems with anemia in general. So just a few things to consider when it's worth uh, getting the GP involved. So this was a bit of an overview as to what leads to constipation and what constipation is as a symptom-based disorder. So how can you support your patients when they come and ask for your help at the pharmacy counter? So the most important step is that here we're focusing on self-care and what the OTC treatment options are. And the NICE guidance always refers to uh, lifestyle changes first and foremost. Ideally, if the uh, root cause is established, for example, it's caused by a particular type of medicine, if possible, that medication needs to be reviewed and changed if, um, if it's possible. But in those cases, if not, then we have to look at different management options. So lifestyle advice, again, really well-known facts. So I'm just going to briefly go through this because I'm sure all of you are aware of these points. Um, but just advise your patient to make sure that they have a healthy, balanced diet with regular meals. So having those frequent, uh, well-balanced meals uh, rather than just having one big meal once a day is very important. Of course, whole grains, uh, fruits that are high in sorbitol, for example, um, apricots, uh, dates, um, prunes, that is something that can help, having lots of veggies in their diet as well. The recommendation is 30 grams of fiber a day. But if your patient is known to not have too much fiber in their diet, when you recommend them to increase it, make sure you add that they need to do this slowly if they increase the fiber intake significantly from one day to the next. Unfortunately, that can lead to some rather unpleasant side effects. So it always needs to be done gradually. Adequate fluid intake and exercise is something that comes obviously from the uh, risk factors that we discussed um, a couple of slides ago. And I already touched on toileting routines. Again, consider your elderly patients. Are they stable on their feet? Do they need, let's say, a Zimmer frame or something they can hold on to? Do they need some further support? Is this a problem that's leading to constipation because they don't have uh, a good stable setting for them to be able to uh, have good, uh, safe toileting routines? And even just simple things like, like raising the knees so if the knee is just above hip height, that is the ideal position uh, for using the toilet. So these are simple things your patients can try. And this is the most important first step based on NICE guidance when it comes to managing acute constipation over the counter. So before I move on to the next step, uh, asking you, uh, I'd like to ask you another question. So the next step will be to share with you the nice guidelines, what to do if lifestyle changes don't work. But before I tell you what the nice guidance says, I would like to ask you what you would recommend, what do you think should be given as first line medicated treatment for your patients? So I'm gonna open the polling question now. Would you recommend an osmotic laxative or a stimulant laxatives? Or do you think a bulk forming laxative is better? Or you're not quite sure? And I'm keeping my fingers crossed that not everybody will say not sure, although based on confidence levels to start with, um, I'm hoping for lots of answers here other than number four. So let's have a look. Excellent. OK, I very much like what I see. Very good answers. Thank you very much. So let's have a look at the NICE guidance. So as I've already mentioned, the very first thing every patient should try when they suffer from acute constipation is lifestyle measures, dietary changes, and exercise. If these are ineffective or the symptoms do not respond adequately, then the NICE guidance recommendation is a stepped approach. So those of you who said you would reach for a bulk forming laxative first, that is indeed the first step in the OTC management of um, constipation. And also, this is the guidance a GP would follow as well when they start prescribing a laxative 
to manage constipation for their patients. So you would start with a bulk forming laxative first and foremost. If stools still remain hard or the patient finds them difficult to pass, then you can add or switch to an osmotic laxative as a step number two. If uh, the stools are soft, but they're still difficult to pass, or there is a um, sensation of incomplete emptying, then a stimulant laxative can be added, but that's, that would be the third step in the NICE guidance. So I would just like to briefly touch on the various different laxatives that I mentioned in the step guidance, and I will bring in uh, the RB products that are relevant for each group. So as I said, bulk forming laxatives are the step one in the NICE guidance. Uh, they increase the bulk of the stools, as in, in the name, help to retain fluid, and they encourage peristalsis, um, but in some cases, they also have stool softening properties as well. Um, you probably are familiar with the active ingredients such as espargula husk, methyl cellulose, or bran. The onset of actu action varies between these different active ingredients, but it can take as long as up to 72 hours. An important consideration is that these should not be taken immediately before bedtime, and it's ever so important for the patient to have enough fluid with this medicine, regardless which one they choose, in order for the active ingredient to take full effect. Now, one thing to remember is bulk forming laxatives are not recommended if the constipation was induced by opioid, for instance. Um, for those patients, you would need to recommend a different type of laxative, um, and I'll come to that in a moment. So bulk forming laxatives, step one. So if we look at the RB portfolio, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with fiber gel. These packages will change from April. So um, if you are unable to go to pharmacy right now and come later on in the year, maybe April main time, fingers crossed you come, you go to a pharmacy and you don't recognize the boxes, don't be surprised. Um, there have been some outward, artwork changed and they are going to look fabulous, uh, but I can't share them with you because they're still a trade secret. So fiber gel contains 3.5 grams of espargula husk in each sachet. They are licensed to be used to relieve constipation and it can be used um, in pregnancy as well if it's considered necessary and lifestyle advice hasn't changed um, the symptoms for the patient. Fibrogel specifically starts to take effect in about 12 to 24 hours, and you need to use a lot of fluid with this. Now, they've tried bulk forming laxatives, um, but the stool still remains quite hard and difficult to pass. Then you might want to consider recommending an osmotic laxative, which would increase the amount of fluid in the large bowel. This way, it produces distension, and it can also lead to stimulate that peristalsis. So for active ingredients, uh, remember things like macrogol, or if it is ineffective, or maybe the patient doesn't tolerate it, then lactulose would be another product to recommend. Again, these don't work immediately. They take about two to, two, two to three days to take full effect, um, but they are suitable for occasional use. So for example, during pregnancy, um, such as bulk forming laxative or osmotic laxative, these can be considered because both of them are safe to use um, if necessary, and they need to be used on a reoccurring basis. Again, adequate fluid intake is essential. The medication will not work appropriately if the patient doesn't have enough water with this. If it comes to, let's say, opioid-induced um, constipation, then your consideration would be an osmotic laxative. You cannot recommend a bark-forming laxative then because... Um, Opioid-induced constipation, the way it develops the pathophysiology behind it means that it will affect the peristalsis in the bowels and it's just not going to work if you use a bulk forming laxative. In fact, you can make the symptoms worse. So just remember, if it's opioid-induced, you have to start with an osmotic laxative. laxative. For any other patient, start with a bulk forming laxative. Um, RB has come out with a new product last year. Uh, in 2020, and this is an osmotic laxative called Senosoft, which contains 10 grams of macrogol 4000 in each sachets. 
Um, this is something that is very wide, the active ingredient, I mean, is very widely prescribed uh, by GPs to manage constipation. And uh, Macrogol 4000 takes about 24 to 72 hours to take full effect um, and is licensed from 12 years of age. The Senosoft as a product itself is sugar and flavor free if this is something that needs to be considered for the patient. And last but not least, um, we need to talk about stimulant laxatives. As I said, they uh, make up a large proportion up to 60% of the OTC constipation market at the moment, um, but we will touch on the changes and what the MHRA is hoping to see as a result. Uh, but we mustn't forget about them because they have a place in uh, the treatment regime. So stimulant laxatives stimulate those nerves that control the muscle lining in the bowel. So if you, if I can find my mouse here. So if you look at, this is a segmentation of the small intestine with the muscle lining. And basically what happens, um, they increase the intestinal motility by stimulating these nerves and kind of push I do it this way, push the bowel content through faster than it would happen otherwise. So they have a much faster on set of action compared to the previous two groups. So for example, Senna can take effect in about eight, potentially up to 12 hours. These are usually recommended to be taken in the evening and the patient would have the result, if you like, by the morning. One thing to remember is that because of their mode of action, they can indeed lead to abdominal cramps as well. So when it comes to the RB portfolio, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Senocot as a brand. Uh, so this contains Senna and it's licensed for short-term use um, to the management of occasional constipation when it's purchased over the counter. As I said, usually taken at night and it takes about eight to 12 hours to take full effect. Very important thing to remember and advise the patients on this. Once regularity has been regained, the patient needs to reduce and then stop taking the medication. Why is this important to emphasize? So I referred to this up scheduling a couple of times now, and I'm sure quite a few of you must have heard about this already because it was um, a result of long years of discussions um, between health regulatory uh, agencies and various different authorities. Um, and then also those groups who write the nice guidances as well. And some of these changes have actually been implemented in other countries some time ago, for example, in Australia. But finally in 2020, the MHRA was able to execute this um, the safest possible way. So what is the rationale behind upscheduling stimulant laxatives? Uh, there are two points to consider here. There is a lot of data that shows that um, elderly patients overuse stimulant laxatives. And then also there ha have been quite a few um, sad cases of patients um, being harmed by misusing stimulant laxatives. Um, those patients who have been suffering uh, with eating disorders. Um, you may have actually read the story about the person who actually passed away because of uh, overdosing on a stimulant laxative. So there have been a lot of discussion in the background, a lot of careful considerations, and the MHRA decided that the safest thing for patients um, is to change uh, the access to this medication, these groups of medicines. So what are the changes? Um, Self-selection GSL line is not available anymore under the age of 18. All the bigger pack sizes have moved to P, pharmacy only line. And if it's required for somebody between the ages of 12 and 18, those have to be um, asked from behind the counter, hoping that the patient uh, representative, parent or carer we'll actually have a discussion with a healthcare professional about this. Um, there's rest restriction on the GSL pack sizes, so only sm small pack sizes are available, and the large pack sizes are pharmacy only. And of course, they updated the patient information leaflets and the SMPs accordingly. 
So this was constipation, and this was the biggest chunk of uh, tonight's presentation. Uh, but I've got two kind of smaller sections to touch as well. Uh, so if you've got any questions about constipation, please just uh, pop it in the chat box and I will try to answer them as best as possible um, at the end. Let's move on to diarrhea. Um, diarrhea is also a symptom-based disorder and it's defined by the World Health Organization as the passage of three or more loose or liquid stools per day. But again, if you look at uh, the type of definition we use for constipation, here you can apply the same principle. Diarrhea can be also defined as more frequent passage of stool that is normal for that particular individual. Diarrhea is a symptom uh, that can have various causes and these causes sometimes are combined. So here we've got a colon cross section. Um, just very briefly, what can lead to diarrhea? So first of all, increased gut motility, meaning that the content of the gut just goes through way too fast and that leads to um, less time for water uh, to reabsorb from the gut. Then it could be a result of increased fluid secretion into the gut or the opposite, there is a decreased fluid absorption from the gut. So these can all lead to the development of diarrhea. Again, there are some different types that we need to uh, establish. So first of all, acute diarrhea, that is something that doesn't last for longer than up to two weeks. You would call it a persistent diarrhea if it lasts for longer than two weeks, but if it lasts beyond four weeks, a month, then you would consider that as a chronic diarrhea case. There are some accompanying syndrome, uh, symptoms uh, that patients might, um, might report when you're talking to them. They can develop cramps, they might feel nauseous, um, flatulence is quite common and they, their belly might feel quite tender. Um, with nausea, sometimes it can actually um, turn into vomiting as well. And in most cases, diarrhea has got a rapid onset. Uh, just a bit of a data for you, just how common it is. Um, according to UK data sets, uh, up to 17 million cases per year are reported that are related to an acute infectious diarrhea. So it is very, very common. So what can cause uh, diarrhea? Infections. So most of the diarrhea is caused by a viral infection and these are usually self-limiting. They take about two to three days to resolve. If it's caused by a bacterial infection, that can occasionally last for up to seven days. But if it's caused by a protozoal infection and it's not treated, then it can actually last a lot longer um, in some cases. Then of course, medication to consider. So laxatives, certain type of antibiotics can uh, lead to diarrhea as well. Some antacids. Uh, patients on chemotherapy often experience diarrhea as well. Um, serotonin, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors can also lead to diarrhea. PPIs are a very common reason, uh, or metformin, just to name a few. But again, this is not an exhaustive list. And then if you think about medical conditions, um, IBS I already mentioned with constipation, it also comes up in the cases of diarrhea as well. Um, different type of, type of inflammatory bowel diseases can also lead to diarrhea, for example, Crohn's disease. But if, for example, a patient has acute appendicitis, that can also present itself with an acute diarrhea case. We also mustn't forget the patients who suffer from anxiety. Um, these kind of um, mental health problems can lead to constipation as well as diarrhea as well. Of course, excess consumption of alcohol or for a lot of patients, some sort of a diet uh, change or even food allergies can lead to the development of diarrhea also. Uh, one thing to consider, so as I said, diarrhea is very common and in most cases it's related to an infection, uh, which means it would resolve itself usually within a couple of days. But um, still we need to consider, especially if it lasts longer than just a few days, certain complications. So the most commonly considered constipation is dehydration, but if it's extreme, it can lead to hypovolemia, a low blood pressure and tachycardia, in which cases that can be quite extreme and the patient needs medical attention. 
There are a couple of red flags, just like with any condition when you are talking to a patient to consider. So if the patient has got diarrhea as well as vomiting and they cannot retain oral fluids, because that is going to increase their chances to develop severe dehydration. If the patient is elderly and they are also reporting blood in their diarrhea, that is something uh, that could, should be considered as a red flag, just like the uh, sudden weight loss that was also mentioned with constipation as well. If we look at the uh, management options, uh, it's a little bit more limited uh, when it comes to diarrhea. But the most important thing to consider is that in most cases, because it's a self-limiting uh, set of symptoms, um, just diet and lifestyle uh, temporary changes can solve the problem so the patient doesn't always need medication. So preventing fluid and electrolyte depletion, um, they can use those rehydration sachets or just generally making sure they uh, try to keep themselves hydrated. If um, the patients otherwise consume dairy products, um, the recommendation is that they need to be reintroduced with caution and slowly because the digestive process may be affected, particularly if it was a um, infectious diarrhea. But otherwise, there is no need to fast, except on the, in those cases when it's related to a particular type of food product food group, in which case the patient should have to start um, writing a food diary to be able to eliminate what might be causing it. If, however, they do require uh, treatment options um, in the form of medicine, then the already mentioned rehydration sachets can be complemented with loperamide as well. So just briefly about loperamide, this is uh, something I'm, I would imagine all of you are familiar with. It's an anti-motility drug that binds to opioid receptors um, that are found in the gastrointestinal tract. And basically it just makes the transit a bit long, take a bit longer and that enables the body to reabsorb the water and therefore stop the diarrhea. It works very fast. Uh, usually the onset of action uh, happens within an hour and it can be managed, uh, can be used to manage acute episodes of diarrhea, for example, that is related with IBS um, and it's licensed from 12 years of age. And then briefly about irritable bowel syndrome, and this is the last condition that I would like to discuss today. I have touched on irritable bowel syndrome already in relation to constipation and diarrhea. And why is that? So first of all, a definition, like a good definition. Um, so irritable bowel syndrome is a chronic, relapsing, and often lifelong disorder of gastrointestinal function. And unfortunately, in most cases, there is no discernible structural or biochemical cause. We can make assumptions, and I'll show you a couple of um, different things that can potentially lead to the development of IBS. But uh, sometimes it's a combination of various different things. And in other cases, they just simply uh, cannot establish what led to the patient of developing IBS. So when it comes to IBS, they classify it based on the predominant symptom. And this is where the two previous chapters come into place, because some patients have diarrhea predominant IBS, whereas other patients can have constipation predominant IBS. Just to make it a bit more complicated, there are patients who have both of these symptoms, and that would be the mixed group. And there is a plus one with unclassified IBS where none of these um, rules apply. So if we look at some epidemiology data behind it, uh, it can affect as many as 20% of people um, within the UK population at one point in their life but it usually affects young people. So if you remember what I said about constipation, that tends to develop more for older people, except if we consider pregnancy. IBS is more common in younger people and the prevalence decreases with increasing age. Once again, affects more women than men. In terms of diagnosis, one important thing to remember is IBS has to be diagnosed by a GP. But 
you can uh, advise the patient whether they should probably go and see the GP and have a discussion if you think these three letters A, B, C, A for abdominal pain or discomfort that is either associated with or relieved by going to the toilet, bloating for B and C, which is probably the most important one, change in bowel habit with constipation, diarrhea or both. As I already mentioned, sometimes um, we can pinpoint uh, certain predisposing factors that can lead to the patient developing um, IBS, but usually the exact underlying cause is unknown. So what sort of things can lead to IBS? Infections, uh, it can completely wipe out the gut um, microbiome, or even if somebody is on particular type of medication that can affect the gut flora, or if the patient has an abnormal uh, gastrointestinal immune function. So these are all kind of interlinked and related. Diet can be a factor in developing IBS um, and also hypersensitivity to certain food groups as well. That is something that can predispose a patient. Again, stress, anxiety, just like how it appeared for those patients developing uh, diarrhea as well as constipation. So these things that we have to consider when we're talking to our patients. And then when it comes to um, the altered brain gut interactions, there is strong evidence that suggests that um, there is an interaction between the central nervous system um, by the regulation um, of, of certain brain chemistry. And please don't ask me exactly what the uh, these chemicals are that are taking part in this process uh, because um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I can certainly find uh, the paper that I read on this. It's really interesting that there is a known link between um, the uh, central nervous system as well as the gut. And um, the, this uh, interaction can influence the neuroendocrine systems um, that are associated with a stress response. So again, stress anxiety comes into the picture uh, and also memory function. So because these can be affected, it can also affect uh, the gut flora as well as can lead to potentially the development of IBS as well. So when it comes to treatment options, um, Unfortunately, this is probably the most complicated and most difficult condition to manage out of all three. But what you can do is to support your patients. Uh, but there is no one size fits all. As I already mentioned, IBS must be diagnosed by a doctor first. But what you can help with is patient education, uh, diet and lifestyle advice. And if it comes to that point, then you can advise them on potentially using certain medication that is available over the counter. Uh, but because the symptoms vary, sometimes for one patient, the symptoms fluctuate between diarrhea and constipation. Um, it's very much some, one of those cases where it's a trial and error. They have to try a product. If it's not working, they need to evaluate and potentially try something else. But what are the general rules? So first of all, when it comes to lifestyle, uh, managing stress uh, and anxiety, depression, any underlying uh, mental health problems can help. Regular physical activity goes hand in hand with weight management that can help um, the patient to keep the IBS symptoms under control and prevent flare-ups. Eating regularly and using fresh ingredients. I cannot emphasize the fresh ingredients enough because if you think about those ready meals or half prepared meals that you can buy in a supermarket, they are full of additives and in most cases, those additives can actually um, be responsible for flare-ups for patients suffering with IBS. Uh, they need to review their fiber intake based on their predominant, symptom, predominant symptoms. So if it's predominantly constipation, increase the fiber intake. If it's predominantly diarrhea, they might need to decrease their fiber intake to make sure that the symptoms are under control. Um, they also need to make sure that they are well hydrated um, very interesting fact, they need to limit their fresh fruit consumption, which cannot be more than three portions a day, about a maximum of 80 grams per, per portion. 
Um, and it's a good idea for somebody who suffers from IBS to keep a food diary so they can pinpoint certain foods that might exacerbate the symptoms. So when it comes to uh, management and treatment guidance, so as I said, the most important thing is lifestyle and dietary management of the symptoms. They would consider medication if the lifestyle interventions are not working, uh, or occasionally if the patient has a flare-up, then um, symptom relief might be needed. For example, as I mentioned with loperamide that is licensed to be used for acute cases of diarrhea for those patients who are suffering from IBS. However, if the patient doesn't have any improvement over a longer period of time, let's say 12 months, when they tried various different types of treatment available, then their doctor can consider alternative therapies such as psychotherapy or hypnotherapy for the referral. Um, in terms of OTC management, what can you support your patients with? So if their main symptom is constipation, consider bulk forming laxative, such as espargula husk, like the fiber gel product, if they have abdominal pain that is associated with their symptoms, then using an antispasmodic can help, for example, mebevirin. So again, just one more product to show you from the uh, RB portfolio. You might have seen this in the dispensary. It's a P-line product that contains 3.5 grams of uh, espagula husk with 135 milligram mebevirin, and it is licensed for the symptomatic relief of IBS symptoms from 12 years of age. Again, adequate fluid intake is ever so necessary with this. If your patient is suffering mainly from diarrhea, I already mentioned the paramide as um, an option for them to use uh, short term for those uh, acute bouts of uh, episodes. And if your patient main symptom is abdominal pain or cramping, then you can recommend an antispasmodic such as alvarin, citrate, mebevirin, or peppermint oil to help to relax the, uh, the smooth muscles in the guts as well and can help to manage uh, the spasm. Um, just very briefly, to give you a bit of an understanding, and I'm nearly at the end of the presentation, I'm just conscious about time. What is the worst uh, experience or the group of symptoms IBS patients are experiencing? What is the most difficult for them to manage? The majority of IBS sufferers say, almost all of them, the symptoms that are related to feeling bloated is the most bothersome symptom. 60% um, of them saying that it's the worst out of all of the symptoms that they're experiencing. And almost 30% of them say that the most bothersome symptom is abdominal pain. So somebody with IBS really needs to get the flare-ups under control because these symptoms are making them really uncomfortable. Um, even things like wearing tight-fitted clothing will be affected uh, if they have a flare-up just because they can feel so uncomfortable. So they would like to try to manage these symptoms first and foremost. So think about your uh, antispasmodics, the alvarin citrate, the mevaverine peppermint oil when you're talking to them. And then just one last product when it comes to peppermint oil and simeticone uh, within the RB portfolio. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Senocam is actually licensed as a medical device because the ingredients in this product are um, acting in a physical way rather than a pharmacological way and it's licensed from six years of age. So with Symeticon, it is something that reduces the surface tension uh, on the gas bubbles in the guts, merging them into one big bubble, and it makes it easier to pass. So that's why it's so effective to help with those gas-related symptoms that patients can experience with IBS. So just one last summary slide for you um, with the RB portfolio. So if you remember constipation, nice guidance, uh, what are the steps to recommend? Diarrhea, uh, usually self-limiting, uh, rehydration sachets if necessary with the dietary management plus loperamide and IBS, manage those bloated symptoms. And also if it's diarrhea, loperamide, if it's constipation, consider bulk forming laxity for your patients. Now, I just wanted to ask a few more test questions to see 
how you feel now that we went through the presentation and then I will um, hand it over to Alex afterwards to um, ask me your questions. So after you've seen the presentation tonight, based on the NICE guidance, what would you reach first as an OTC medicated treatment option for acute constipation? Would you recommend an osmotic laxative, a stimulant one, or a bulk forming laxative? Or you feel like you're still not quite sure and you refer your patient? So let's see. Oh, okay. That makes me very happy. So if I wasn't on camera, I would probably do a bit of a victory dance there. Excellent. So yes, indeed. First line OTC recommendation if lifestyle advice fails, bulk forming laxatives. You guys all nailed this. Excellent. Really, really good to see this. So if we look at the number, I've got a bit of a comparison slide here. So you can all see how we started at the beginning of the webinar and where we are now. All of you understand that the first line recommendation is bulk forming laxatives. Excellent. So now that you've seen the presentation, how do you feel about diagnosing these patients on lower GI condition? Very confident on most confident, hopefully it will be in those two points. Let's have a look. Oh, massive shift. This is amazing to see. And I haven't got a single person who said not confident or still or training. So that makes my training cart very, very happy. And I can just show you a bit of a comparison because I love to see this if it comes on the screen. Excellent. So nearly 90% of you are very confident on most of confident on some, which is excellent to see. Thank you. And one last question. How confident are you after making the diagnosis now on advising your patients? And the very last polling question. Excellent. Same jump in numbers. Whoop, whoop. This is amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and that was me. Alex, over to you. Thank you so much for sticking with me for this rather long presentation. Um, I could see some questions coming through. So Alex, if you'd like to just pick them from the chat box and I'll try to answer as many as I can. Perfect. Yes. Thank you very much for that amazing webinar again, Lizzie. And I know we've seen from, from those numbers some absolutely amazing results. So I hope everybody has taken that away with them and got a lot. So, yeah, we've had some really engaged um, students, lots of questions. So um, I'll try and ask them in sort of group order, starting with constipation. Um, just a few ones that came up. So um, for, I think, a first year student, what is um, faecal impaction? Really good question. Um... Unfortunately, it's one of those cases where there is some sort of a, a blockage which stops the stool moving through the bowels. And what happens is initially it kind of slows down and it gets stuck. That's the best way to describe it. But then as the patient continues to consume more and more stool starts to build up and it creates a kind of a pocket where the bowel can actually start to stretch out. So um, it's obviously potentially dangerous if it's not managed. Uh, these patients are likely to um, have to go and see the GP, but it can be managed with medication. If you look up the SNPC for uh, Movicol, uh, probably you'll find it in some other macrogol products as well, but Movicol is one of those where in the information leaflet or in the SMPC, there is a specific instruction how to use that, Movicol is an osmotic laxative, how to use that to manage fecal infection because what you want to do is soften it and then make sure that it starts moving across. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting things about fecal infection is that the patient may still pass stool because what happens is it's usually hard stool that kind of starts to build up like rabbit poo kind of thing. 
but then some liquid still can actually go through the holes uh, in the bowel and patient can still pass stool, but they feel like they have uh, a sensitive tummy, sensitive to touch. They feel like they're constipated, but at the same time, it's almost like they have a bit of a diarrhea. So it's something that needs to be assessed by a GP by feeling the abdominal area, and it needs to be treated as a matter of urgency because it can cause serious constipation. But basically, it's a blockage that just keeps building. Perfect. Thank you. So still on constipation, we've talked about those remedies that can be used for older children and adults. What would you advise a parent for a constipation in their young child? It very much depends on the age of the child, how long constipation has been going on for. Is the child in any pain? Any pain? So if I give you an example. If it's a small child when they are weaning the child off, uh, uh, for example, breast milk, you will expect constipation to develop. It's just a natural way of things. In most cases, uh, hydration can help. Um, if it's a bit of an older child and it's to do with, let's say, uh, potty training, again, it's something that is a hurdle that you need to get through. However, if you need to treat a child, you have various different considerations. So something like um, over-the-counter, something you can recommend would be a lactulose solution. If the parent is willing to try it, then if, for example, for potty training, something that sometimes works quite well is um, a glycerol suppository. But please remember, it's not mentioned in the NICE guidance. Um, in a lot of cases, it's not necessarily a first line choice, but it very much depends on that individual patient. If it's an older child, you need to ask questions. Sometimes they are just simply picky and they are not in eating enough uh, fruit and vegetables or they're simply not drinking enough fluid. So with children, always try lifestyle first, and then that all fails. Then depending on the age of the child, they can use bulk forming laxative or um, lactulose if necessary. Um, those would be the first choices, definitely. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I still just got a few more on constipation. So why would unexplained sudden weight loss be a red flag? Um, I can actually give you a very uh, personal example to this. So uh, my dad was, he, he's okay now, but 11 years ago, he was diagnosed with colon cancer. And this is why I emphasize so much that when you're talking to your patients, make sure that they feel comfortable to talk to you, that nobody else can overhear it because people don't like to talk about this. <clears throat> Excuse me just like my dad didn't like to talk about his problems. So he was severely constipated and we didn't know. And the only thing my mum noticed was that um, he started putting the belt further, the, the belt buckle further in. And by the time the diagnosis was made, he lost about 20 kilos of his body weight. My dad is a very tall man uh, and it was uh, heartbreaking to see what happened. So usually a sudden weight loss means that there is something more sinister going on. And I'm not saying that every single patient who comes into the pharmacy with constipation and sudden weight loss has got cancer, but it's definitely a warning sign that needs to be considered. So asking a lot more questions can help you to understand because it could be that they wanted to lose weight. They went on a diet and there are so many crazy bad diets out there on the internet. They started following something that was definitely unhealthy. It made them lose weight, but then equally changed their bowel habits and just resulted in them not absorbing the right type of nutrients. So that could be a very simple explanation, <clears throat> excuse me, but in some cases, unfortunately, sudden weight loss means that there is something else going on, for example, cancer. So in that case, if the patient is able to open up to you a little bit more, please, please make sure, if you're not sure, get a more senior colleague involved or just ask them to go to the GP. Or if you can, bring the GP yourself if you have that kind of relationship. Brilliant. Thank you for going through that and being able to tell us that really personal story. So thank you for that. And I think that really does 
emphasize that every interaction we have we have a potential to save lives <laughs> save lives and i know it's a cliche but guys trust me if you work in community pharmacy if you work in hospital pharmacy or even in clinical trials that's what you'll be doing so be confident to ask questions and just ask for help if you're not sure perfect thank you very much and i know a lot of people will have taken that on we'll do um just two more quick ones on constipation and then we've got a few more on the other topics um so if you are suggesting um somebody takes more fiber in their diet um what would be a sensible way to suggest this so obviously some people won't know what 30 grams of fiber is um, in a meal so how would you go about telling the patient what they need it's very difficult to put a um, weight tag on the different levels of fiber people find in food. So I think the reality is if somebody really struggles, then one thing you can recommend is use a fiber supplement. So for example, if you think about espargula husk, if I talk about RB Brands Fiber Gel, that is actually a fiber supplement. So that's the easiest way for the patient to manage if they find it too fiddly to think about every single meal. OK, what is it I can have with some fiber in it? So fruit, vegetables, oats, um, these sort of things. Or if they simply don't like eating veggies where, you know, some people prefer potatoes over everything else, but they seem to have some fiber, then use a fiber supplement. That's the easiest way. Uh, there are some guidelines available online where you can have a rough uh, you can get a rough idea how much fiber there is in an average size apple or um, even potato contains some not much really uh, broccoli these sort of things um, so if the patients are willing to do that um, use the table but for some patients a simple fiber supplement will suffice brilliant and um, I've got two questions on um stimulant and stimulant laxative abuse so i'll put them sort of together so um somebody has asked um in the um nice guidelines of it would there be a problem in taking the three types of laxatives and then to go in with it if you think a sub if you think a patient is abusing laxatives um what laxative would be the safest advice even if you don't want to give one but suspect they might go to another pharmacy it's a very difficult situation, but us pharmacists have got the responsibility and the authority to refuse the sale. So there's no difference if you consider codeine-based painkillers. Uh, they have the rule of not selling more than one pack at a time. Uh, I'm sure if you worked in pharmacy, you probably uh, know that you're out there, a patient comes in, you ask the question, have you used this before? And they say, no, never. And they've got the exact change in their hand. So, you kind of, it's, you, you develop the sense and also if it's a regular returning patient, uh, your healthcare assistant may recognize them. And you have got the right and the authority and it's expected of you as a healthcare professional to step in. And the best thing to do is have a conversation about it and ask the patient because it might be that they just need some help in terms of their lifestyle. Uh, they might suffer from some mental health problems they are very stressed at work. So you have got the responsibility to intervene. Um, you can refuse the sale of a, a stimulant laxative. Um, and in terms of the safest recommendation would be, uh, is based on NICE guidance, use a bulk forming laxative to start with. If they do suffer from constipation, they suffer from it regularly. The best thing to do is use a bulk forming laxative every single day to maintain regularity. That's the best way, best advice I can give. Again, it's based on individual basis, uh, but be comfortable and confident to intervene if you need to. Perfect, thank you very much. So we'll move away from constipation, I'm aware of the time. So we'll have a few questions on the other topics um, and anything else we can redirect and then we'll just have a few minutes um, about what's coming up with BPSA. So um, on to the topic of diarrhea. Um, what are the main um, dietary changes for treating diarrhea? So in terms of dietary changes, the most important thing I would recommend is, particularly if there is a reason to believe that it's related to infections, to not to have dairy products. Uh, 
because uh, the villi in the bowels can be affected by an infection, a lot more difficult to digest um, dairy products. But other than that, there's no reason to fast. If anything, if somebody suffers from diarrhea, you really want to keep up your energy levels. Um, of course, there's no point having a good spicy and greasy curry. Be sensible. Um, there's no need to skip meals, but having smaller meals, things that are a little bit easier to digest. If it's a um, diary that lasts for a couple of days, maybe uh, having a little bit overcooked rice can also help in addition. And some fiber-based products just to slow down those bowel motions as well, that can help. Um, if the diarrhea is caused by uh, other things, for example, um, there is a reason to believe that it's food sensitivity and the person needs to start a food diary and uh, stopping different type of food groups for a week or so, see whether the symptoms resolve and then reintroduce introduce them slowly. If the symptoms resolve and then when reintroducing, they come back, then you kind of pinpoint what's causing the diarrhea itself. Uh, most important thing is no fasting, but with, be careful with dairy product and no um, spicy or very fatty food. That's basically the most important thing to remember. Brilliant. Yeah. And I think the food diary is often something that tends to get overlooked. We go straight to those medicinal and herbal products that actually we've already discussed, but actually knowing the triggers is one of the biggest parts as well, because it will be different in every person and some people have those sensitivities. Exactly. Very good point. Um, we did just have um, the last one for diarrhea. Um, so, um, uh, when roughly would you, um, in a community pharmacy, refer to the GP as some people have been told it's at day three? Okay, so I guess there needs to be some sort of a guideline, but again, it's not that simple, uh, black and white. So you'll need to make a decision on a on an If it's a child, um, usually you wouldn't leave it for longer than 24 hours. However, uh, I I mean a young child. Um, however, the recommendation is instead of taking the child to the GP practice, um, I guess in COVID, um, you would automatically call anyway rather than just turning up at the practice, but always call, call first. But the most important question you need to ask, is the patient able to keep, them, keep themselves hydrated? If they drink well, then with a general bacterial um, infection that leads to diarrhea, it's self-limiting, and I said that at least lasts about two to three days. So the three day uh, guideline is a rough but fairly accurate uh, guidance to consider, unless the patient has got underlying medical conditions um, that can predispose them to complications, or they're also vomiting and they are at risk of severe dehydration. Excellent, thank you. And last few questions for you, um, and then we'll let you we'll let you have a breather after that amazing webinar. So, with IBS, why is it something that needs to be diagnosed by a GP before pharmacy treatment? So, the problem with that, with IBS is, as I mentioned, it's very very difficult to diagnose. Um, they usually cases use a process of elimination type of approach because there are no laboratory tests, there are no uh, scan-based testing options to make that diagnosis. So the patient needs to go through several loops before the diagnosis is being made and it's not something that would be possible uh, within the boundaries of a pharmacy. So you and suggest the patient to start a discussion with the GP if you have reason to believe based on the ABC information that I shared with you and some other fluctuating between diary and constipation that is something always to, to flag. You can advise the patient to go to the GP but because it's such a long process to determine that the patient has got IBS, it's the safest option for the patient to have it confirmed by a doctor and even sometimes the GP doesn't feel comfortable and then they refer the patient to uh, a hospital review as well. Great. And um, one of the last ones for IBS, and it's about uh, what's the reason for limiting fresh fruit? 
Okay, so that's a really good question. Um, the thing with fruit, it contains quite a lot of fructose, uh, some more than others. So it very much depends on the, on the fruit itself. So for example, for patients who suffer from constipation, may actually be a good thing to have high fructose content fruit in their diet to help with constipation. However, the problem with fructose is that quite a, a large amount of fructose itself goes through the gut um, without any changes or being absorbed. And what happens in the colon, it starts to, which then can lead to those ever so uncomfortable sensation of feeling bloated, being full of gas. So there is a lot of data to show that high fructose diet can exacerbate the symptoms of an IBS sufferer and can, can make their symptoms worse. Hence, why the recommendation to have less fruit in your diet. Perfect. Thank you. And the last one is for people taking uh, loperamide, uh, can they um, get tolerance to it? And the same, I suppose, for all of the, um, all the medications we've covered tonight. So uh, that's actually quite a difficult question. If quickly answer the others first. So and bulk forming laxatives no because it's basically a natural fiber so uh, it's almost like having natural fiber from other sources like vegetables in the diet so no the patient can use it regularly safely every day that's their choice uh, if, they, if they find it necessary because otherwise they can't keep it up regularity so they won't get used to that osmotic laxatives Again, that is not something that you would use every day, but for a reoccurring use, that's acceptable. Uh, it is unlikely that you would develop tolerance to that. The problem uh, comes when we're talking about um, stimulant laxatives, because the way they work in the body, indeed, if it's used regularly, patients do develop tolerance and they sometimes require higher and higher doses. Hence why I mentioned misusing elderly patients. Um, when I was working in a care home department for a pharmacy, I have seen some shockingly high doses of um, system and laxative prescribed for patients, and they actually needed it because any, anything lower than that, outside the recommended dose, I mean. Um, so yes, you can get used to stimulant laxatives. That's why the MHRA is so strongly recommending the reduction in their use. When it comes to loperamide, again, it is difficult uh, to say because there are very few patients who would require this on a regular basis. Uh, I'm going off track here a little bit. You would probably see loperamide on a regular prescription for somebody who is wearing a colostomy bag uh, because they simply may just require, depending on where the colostomy bag sits, in which section of their bowels, or sometimes patients suffer from uh, diverticulitis, uh, which is uh, a lot more complicated uh, and it needs to be treated with various different medication, including loperamide. And in some cases, they do have to take it over a certain period of time. There is a risk that it can become ineffective, but loperamide is so infrequently used on an everyday basis that I think it's probably not something you would come across very often. Uh, if that is the case, then of course, um, the GP probably would need to involve a specialist to manage the patient's symptoms. Perfect. And we'll do one last final question that sort of um, is a bit of a, a specific one. So um, what is upscheduling? Okay. so. This is a new term that I've never known existed. If you type it in, then um, Microsoft Word underlines it saying it's wrong, the spelling. Upscheduling is basically changing the legal classification of a drug. So you may have heard about downscheduling when something from prescription only to moves, uh, that moves to P-line. So you have seen the Pfizer Viagra. So that's downscheduling. Upscheduling means that from a lower legal category, it moves up to higher. So this is what happened with um, stimulant laxatives. So stimulant laxatives, for the majority of them, they 
full GSL line, so general sales list available for self-selection without having to talk to a healthcare professional. Uh, laxatives in bigger pack sizes have now moved to P pharmacy only, which means when they want to purchase a bigger pack or if they want it for a 12 to 18, 18 year old uh, child, they have to talk to a healthcare professional because it's behind the counter. So up scheduling means that it went up a schedule in terms of the legal classification. I hope that makes sense. I don't know who came up with the terminology, but it kind of um, summarizes what happened um, in August last year. Brilliant. So that does draw an end to tonight's webinar. So thank you very much, Lizzie. Do you just want to talk about the feedback questionnaire that you have on VVOX? Um, yes, so I have launched the um, survey question. So all of you who have accessed the website, the, the polling questions, you should be able to survey, see a survey on there. So there are a couple of questions. Thank you, Alex, for reminding me. So, so grateful for any feedback, um, any kind of uh, constructive criticism, if you have any any requests maybe you have for topics that uh, we can help uh, to present with, um, you help your studies with, uh, or just general kind of how you found the timing, the presentation, um, and there are some rating questions as well in terms of the topic as well as the presenter. Sorry, but my boss needs to see what I've done today. So anyway, I would really appreciate if you could take some time to, um, in the survey questions. Um, Alex, I don't know if you uh, have anything else for me, um, but I would like to say just thank you so much again for giving me the opportunity to run the webinar tonight. So um, second one, uh, hopefully not the last. So I really, really enjoyed uh, being on the call today and thank you to everybody who um, gave up their Wednesday evening to join us. Um, I hope you found it useful. Uh,